Be seated. Song invitation will be 285. 285. As you can see from your news and notes, the title of our lesson this morning is Shall We Gather at the River? I think I've shared with you before that I grew up in a small congregation in Brown County called the Pikes Peak Church of Christ. Uh, I was baptized into Christ in the summer, I think August of 1970. Uh, that's, that's quite a few years ago. Uh, we did not have a baptistry in, in the building. And in fact, uh, there were a lot of congregations and buildings that didn't have uh, ba baptistries at that time. We kind of just take it for granted that everyone has a baptistry, but we didn't. When I was very, very young, I remember sometimes we'd go across the street and there was a creek. And there, there were some deep pools in that, that creek. And, and so uh, the preacher and the person to be baptized would try to cross and go over the rocks and everything to do that. I was baptized in a pond. We, we had a family, family that were members there and they had a nice lake. That's, that's where I was baptized. It's kind of nice to, to be out in nature like that. Of course, it's not so nice in January or February when sometimes you've got to break the ice uh, to do it. It wasn't too pleasant then. And there, there was an old song. I don't think it's in our songbook today uh, uh, entitled, Shall We Gather at the River? Uh, discussing this particular point. Shall we gather at the river to... Uh, I think in this case it's kind of basing it on some passage of scriptures in the book of, of Revelation, but uh, I think for our purposes this morning, we, we can look at it and saying, shall we gather at the river to, to baptize? Uh, we have noticed that baptism it was an important part of becoming a Christian. It's not the only thing, as we'll look at here in a few minutes, but we see that individuals could not uh, obey the gospel and get into a safe condition without baptism. And unfortunately today we have a lot of religious groups who wants to completely eliminate that process, that practice, or in some way or some form they uh, pervert its significance and its importance. And so I think it's important from time to time that we be reminded of that in conversations that we might have with others who, so that we can kind of be on our game and, and know what we should say. And also occasionally, we, perhaps we've got some visitors and guests here, and this could be informative to them and cause them to think about some important aspects of our salvation. And I think the reason that we're here this morning is we want to go to heaven. We all have that similar interest. And uh, we could go out and do a survey, do a poll in our area, just here in the Indianapolis area, and we would get all kinds of opinions on how you get to heaven. Some people say they don't even believe in heaven. But for those that do, you, you'd probably have hundreds of thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of ways that you can get to heaven. That's all we read of in the scriptures. Jesus once said that the way to eternal life is uh, narrow and straight. It's not wide and broad. That's the way that leads to destruction, eternity in hell. But there's one thing that we need to keep in mind. We talk about baptism. That's not all that's involved. And we see that there are things that precede baptism. There's a certain level of understanding that we must have. That's not to suggest that we have to know the Bible frontwards, backwards, sideways, be able to sit down and quote it all. But we do need to understand certain elements about Jesus Christ. That's the gospel, his death, his burial, his resurrection. That's part of what we discuss when we say that an individual needs to have faith. In Mark 16 and verse 16, we see that Jesus in his great commission said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. It's always been amazing to me that with such verses like this that are spoken in with crystal clarity and simplicity, people still want to set these verses aside look at a verse like that and say, well, baptism isn't necessary. When Jesus said quite clearly, he that believeth and is baptized. Now, the important thing is you need to have belief. If you're baptized without belief, you just got wet. You're not obeying the gospel. 
You're not going to be added to the church by God himself, as we can read of in Acts 2 and verse 47. Hebrews 11 and verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please God. A person may ask the question, well, what do you mean by faith? Well, it means a whole lot more than simply say, well, yeah, I think there's a God, there's a supreme being up there somewhere. We need to be a little bit more specific, mainly that we believe that Jesus did dwell here on earth for 33 years, almost 2,000 years ago, that he wasn't just a human, mortal individual, but that he was the Son of God, he'd come from heaven, that he died on the cross, but that was not the end, because his tomb is empty. The third day following his death, he resurrected. He appeared to his disciples and his apostles and others, and then he returned to heaven, as we can read of in Acts, the first chapter. That's part of what the faith is. That's what you've got to understand. If you don't accept that and you don't understand that, it's pointless for you to be baptized. Well, something else that we see is required in Acts 2 and verse 38. Peter tells them on the day of Pentecost to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. If we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, if we believe in God, then we should hopefully want to serve Him and please Him. And that means that we're going to change the direction in our life. That's what the word repent means, to turn around. We've all been traveling, and especially before the, the uh, GPS era, or maybe you had to rely on a map or your memory, and we've all been in situations where we discover we're going the wrong way. A lot of times men don't like to admit that. But eventually you discover you're going the wrong way, you're wasting a lot of time, you're going to be late for appointment, and then what has to happen? You have to change your direction. Maybe you're going to have to do a 180. If you don't do that, you're not going to get to your destination. Now, as I said a moment ago, all of us have the same destination. We want to go to heaven. But sometimes in life we, we end up going the wrong way. That's what sin is. Sin takes us away from God. It doesn't take us closer to God. It takes us away from Him. And so before we can become a Christian, we have to acknowledge that, yes, I am a sinner. We must admit I am hopelessly lost. There's no way I can be saved without Jesus Christ. You have to be willing to admit that. That's important. I need Jesus Christ to be saved. And I'm going to walk with Him, and I'm going to live in a manner that will be worthy of him. We can also see, other passages of scriptures tell us, that we need to be willing to confess that publicly. Yes, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You've probably seen that on numerous occasions if you've witnessed baptism. Usually a question is asked to the person, do you believe with all of your heart that Jesus is the Son of God? And they say yes. That it is an important and significant confession. That needs to be vocalized. Others need to hear it. That doesn't mean you have to have a building full of people, but I think it's good to have a few individuals. There's been times I've baptized people with maybe just two or three other individuals around, sometimes in the middle of the night. But still we take that confession so that there's no misunderstanding and because we read of examples of that in Scripture. 1 Peter 3 and verse 21 tells us quite specifically that baptism now saves you and that it's an appeal to God for a clean conscience. Sometimes people say, well, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I'm willing to acknowledge that I'm a sinner and I'm willing to repent and I'm willing to make a confession, but I don't want to be baptized. I, I, I don't want to go through that. And so a person may ask the question, well, if I, if I do everything else with baptism, can I go to heaven? The answer is no. Not according to scripture. And that may upset some people, but all we've got to go on is the scripture, and especially the verses that we've already looked at thus far. We have to go all the way. It's kind of like I can remember when I was going to get my driver's license. Well... You get your learner's permit, and about the time you turn 16, you can hardly wait, and that's usually when teenagers start bugging their parents about getting their learner's permit so they can get out there and drive. I know when I was out with my father, I made him a nervous wreck. He had to turn the, the whole process over to my mother because he just didn't have patience for me. I was trying to run off the road and everything else. 
But then, you see, you, you, you do that, and then, then I took driver's ed. Back then, they had driver's ed in school, high school. I don't think they have that any longer. But then there was another process, and that is I, I had to go to the driver's license branch and take a written test. And I did that, and I passed that, but they didn't just give me a license there. See, I, I, had, I, I had a learner's permit. I had taken an instruction course at school. I, I studied the book that they give you with all the rules of the road, and I passed that, but they didn't give me a license because there was one more step. I had to take an actual driver's test, actual driver's test. Unfortunately for me, I failed that because I had a little minor accident, which was really embarrassing, especially when I went home and the whole family says, well, let me see that driver's license. They don't say much, you know. Then my friends, oh, you going to take us out in a drive? And once, you know, it was embarrassing. But a month later, I was able to go back and, and get it. But you see, they didn't give me that driver's license until I had gone through the whole process. Not just after step one or step two, but all the way. It's the same thing if you go to college. You might say, well, it's a four-year program. I'll get a bachelor's degree, but it'll only go three years. Well, shouldn't I get credit for that? Shouldn't I go ahead and get my diploma? The university, college is going to say no. Not till you go all the way. Not till you complete and satisfy the curriculum. And also the requirements of the school, they're not going to give you a diploma. We understand that in life. But I've never understood why people want to make a difference and exception when it comes to our salvation. And I don't know why people would want to. Do you want to take a chance on that? Do you want to take a chance on losing your soul if you're wrong? Almost, I was almost saved, Lord. What kind, of, what kind of answers are you going to give Jesus in the day of judgment when you're standing before him? He says, well, how come you never were baptized? You got so close. And he said, well, I didn't want to get all wet, and I didn't believe that, and I didn't think it was necessary, and, and I'm just kind of stubborn. That, that's just the way I am. Those are going to sound like some really feeble remarks and comments. They're just excuses. They're, they're not reasons. We need to understand that baptism is something that places us into Christ. We want to be in Christ. We can't go to heaven unless we are in Christ. John 14, verse 6 Jesus himself said this. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus emphasized that over and over again. You want to get to God, you got to do it through Jesus Christ. Some people, they want to bypass Christ. Well, I believe in God, but I don't believe in Jesus. There's a lot of Jews today. Well, they believe in God, and they believe, yeah, Jesus did live, but they don't believe he's the Son of God. They don't believe he's the Messiah. They don't believe that he's, he's the Christ. Well, they can't get to God without going through Jesus Christ. You're not going to get to God through Buddha. You're not going to get to God through Muhammad or Joseph Smith. Those are not going to be individuals that's going to help you to get to God. It has to be Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 2, verse 10, for this reason... I endure all things for the sake of those who are cho chosen, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 4, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus. And then Romans. We had a... Good discussion this morning from the book of Romans. We've just begun a study on Wednesday evening in the book of Romans, and it's, it's full of, of, of a wealth of material and information that can be beneficial to each and every one of us, especially this passage in Romans 6, verses 3 through 4. Paul says, Or do you not know that all of us that have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore we've been buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised for the dead through the glory of the Father so we too might walk in newness of life. One of the things that Jesus gives us through the gospel is forgiveness of sins. Redemption from our sins. And here he's, that's, when that happens then we're walking in newness of life. Scriptures tell us we're like a new creature in the life. 
Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3 that we have to be reborn. We can only do that, as this passage of Scripture says, when we are baptized into Christ. We need to also understand that when we're baptized, it forms a new relationship with God. We all recall that man got himself into trouble, man and woman, back in the Garden of Eden, continued to be an issue. And a very powerful, poignant passage of Scripture is found in Isaiah 59, 1 through 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, neither is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Some people get a little stubborn and obstinate and say, well, that's just who I am, and I'm not going to change, and God is going to just have to accept me the way that I am. He will not. People say, well, he loves us. Yes, he does. It's kind of like parents that love their children, but there are times when parents say no. And in some cases, the reason they're saying no is because they love their children. Now their children may get upset, they may storm into the room, slam the door, throw some things around, but that's not gonna help because mom and dad said no. And if mom and dad gives in repeatedly over and over again, it's gonna create a lot of problems and issues. Sin has separated us from our God, but Jesus Christ has removed that separation. Now we can be reconciled to God. Now we can walk with God. We can be, our relationship with God can be as he had originally intended it to be in the Garden of Eden. In 2 Corinthians 5, 18, now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We all understand the concept of reconciliation. Sometimes we, we hear of a husband and wife that's having trouble and what do we say? Well, they've reconciled. They got back together. They worked out the problems. Maybe you're having difficulty with a friend and there's been a disagreement and you don't feel comfortable around each other anymore and you're not really talking, but then something happens, you get back together, you talk it out, you reconcile. In our Bible study class that we had discussing and looking at conflict resolution, we spoke a lot about reconciliation. The Bible talks a lot about reconciliation. Man and woman sinned in the Garden of Eden that created the separation between God and mankind. Jesus removed that barrier, giving us the ministry of reconciliation. Romans 6, 4, Therefore we've been buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from uh, through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. We just read that a moment ago. So look at 1 Peter 1, 22 through 23. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you've been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and abiding word of God. Well, baptism does something else. You see, baptism is that line. Before baptism, we're in the world. We're lost. Hopelessly lost. But then at that moment of baptism, we see all of these things that we've been discussing, the redemption of our sins, the forgiveness of our sins, the ministry of reconciliation, having hope of heaven that takes place. That's kind of like that. That line. We have a lot of lines in life. We graduate from high school. We get our diploma. We're no longer a high school student. We moved on. Maybe we go on to college and we get a diploma there. We, we're, we now have that college degree. Then we get married. That's, a, that's another line in life that we cross. The day before we get married, we're unmarried. We're single. And then after we get the marriage license and after the ceremony, now we're married at that point. The same point when you bring home that little baby from the hospital. You were not a parent, now you are a mother or father. We understand that. It's the same thing with becoming a Christian. 
Baptism is, is that line. We now step into a new relationship with God and now a new relationship with the world that takes place. I want us to go back to Acts 2, look at a couple of verses here that I think are very familiar to us, but they, they convey to us some meaningful points that I think it can help us understand our relationship with the world and God. In verse 41, and this is after we looked at Acts 2.38 earlier where Peter told them on the day of Pentecost to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Then in verse 41 we see the result. So then those who had received the word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. It's a lot of people. A lot of people. It says they were baptized. Why were they baptized? Well, Peter told them and directed them to be baptized back in Acts 2.38. He just didn't say, repent, come into the kingdom and you'll be added to the church. He said, no, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Once again, one of those verses that's crystal clear, easy to understand, but yet it's sad that so many people misunderstand. Now, in verse 47 pretty important verse, helping us to understand the church, the kingdom of God. It says, praising God and having favor with all the people, the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Keep in mind this is the same chapter. We look at the context. Who were those that were being saved? Those who were being baptized. Those who had repented. Those who believed. Those who had repented. Confessing that Jesus is the Son of God and they were immersed in the waters of baptism. We need to remember that the church is composed of those people called out of the world. When we are baptized into Christ, it's like we're leaving the world, not that we're getting into a rocket ship and going to the moon or Mars or something like that. But that we're, we're leaving the world in a spiritual sense. The Bible talks a lot about that. And sometimes we as Christians, we... we we're, we're kind of cozy with the world. We're, we're comfortable with it. I'm talking about the things in the world, things of the flesh, the things that are hostile to, to our, our spirit and our relationship with God. James speaks of this in James 4, verse 4. You adulterers, do you not know the friendship of the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. We don't want to be a friend of the world because once we're baptized into Christ, now we are walking with God. We need to turn our back on the world. Matthew 12, verse 30, Jesus says, He who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. Sometimes we can think we can do both. Well, I have one foot in the world, and I have one foot in the kingdom, and I can do it all. We're lying to ourselves. When we do, we like to compartmentalize. Well, on Fridays and Saturdays, I'm going to go out and party and get drunk and do whatever I want to. If I want to commit immoral acts, I'll just do that. But then on Sunday morning, I'll be there. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And some people lie to themselves for years and years and years, thinking they, they're going to be able to get by with that. Having the best of both worlds. When it comes to our relationship with God, it's an all or nothing proposition. It's all or nothing. It's not just a 50% commitment. It has to be a 100% commitment. Baptism transfers our citizenship to heaven. Every once in a while you read articles where people transfer their, their citizenship. Immigration has always been a big part of this country. We've got a Statue of Liberty out in, in New York. When people coming in, immigrants back in the, the late 1800s and early 1900s, they passed through Ellis Island. He did it legally. There's a legal way and an illegal way to do it. But we can see that the, for those individuals that are willing to obey the laws of the land and come in legally, that, that then they're welcomed with open arms. All of us are probably descendants of immigrants to this country. And some people transfer their citizenship here. You can even read some articles where people leave the U.S. They, they move up to Canada and they want a Canadian membership. They want to go to, to London, England. Well, I want to get an English residency. Or maybe they want to go to Australia or New Zealand. 
They transfer their citizenship. Sometimes individuals have a dual citizenship. Now, we, we sometimes think we can do that. Well, I'll have a citizenship in the world and also a citizenship in heaven. It doesn't work there. It doesn't work there, does it? We see it in 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 11 through 12. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as father would his own children, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. God's calling all people. It doesn't matter what your nationality is. It doesn't, mean what, doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. We're all one to God. All one in Christ. We see that, that Paul once said, it doesn't matter whether you're bond or free, Jew or Gentile, male or female, we're all one in Christ. The world could be more like that. It would be a much better place, a much better place to, to live in. That's what God intends for all of us. In Galatians 1, verses 13 through 14, For he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. We want to transfer our citizenship to heaven, to God's kingdom. Now sometimes we may say, well, someone says, what state are you from? We say, well, I'm from Indiana. And what country are you from? Well, United States of America. We say that. But you know what would really be interesting if somebody says, well, where are you a citizen? We'd say, well, in God's kingdom. Heaven. Now some people probably kind of look at you and think you need, need some therapy or something. Yeah. Get, get some help. But sometimes we could, we could create, uh, present a very interesting view and cause people to stop and think. A very pass powerful passage of scripture, Philippians 3, verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. As Christians, that's what we need to think. Our citizenship is not here on this earth, but it's in heaven. That's where we're heading, that's where we're going. And, as we've been saying, baptism changes our status on earth. 1 Peter 2.11, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fresh fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Sometimes we go on vacations. They visit another state in their country. Maybe we, we visit another country. And when we do that, we, we kind of feel out of place. Maybe we can't speak the, the native language. We're not familiar with their culture, their way of life. And it, it's nice to, to, to see some of the, the significant sights and attractions, and, and that can be impressive, but we just don't feel home there. We're aliens. We're strangers. That's what we are. And that's how, as Christians, we're supposed to feel when we're here on this earth. Aliens and strangers. We're not going to feel comfortable until we're home with God. Jesus once said that he's gone to prepare a place for us, and where he is, we can be there also. Jesus said in Luke 16, 13, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. As we said earlier, baptism changes the direction of our life. Just as we looked at the illustration, sometimes when driving, we, we heading in the wrong direction, we have to change that direction. When we become a Christian, that takes place. Now, there's something we need to remember. That doesn't mean that after we become a Christian, after we're baptized, we're always going to be heading in the right direction. Sometimes we take detours in life, don't we? We take a detour. We start heading in the wrong direction. And the devil's good at that. He's got all kinds of detours out there. Oh, come here and check this out. Come over here and check this out. And sometimes we wander and drift away back into the world. You ever been in the woods somewhere, deep woods, and you get lost? That can be a little bit frightening. I mean, you don't know what, especially if you don't have a compass or something like that to kind of help and, and guide you. Not everybody's used to finding their way in nature. You know, which is east and which is west, and where does the sun rise and where does it set, and what 
what side of a tree is moss growing on, all those kind of things that, that can help you a little bit if you're lost in finding your way. And we need to understand that in a similar way, that's true for us. If we get lost and we head back into the world, we need to open our eyes. Perhaps what we need to do is open up God's word. We need to spend some time with him in prayer so that we can change our direction and get back on that narrow and straight road that leads to heaven. To me, one of the most frightening passages of scriptures in all the Bible. A lot of times we don't like to read these verses because they are frightening. But I think that can be a positive and not a negative. First, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. And to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Now, we might say, well, that'd be impressive. That'd be a real sight to see. But then we read on. Dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And some people must say, well, now, wait a minute, Lord. You love us. Lord, you love us. You're not going to do anything like that. Well, that's what he says. That's what Paul says. Yeah, God does love us. Because of that, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth. If he didn't love us, he wouldn't have done that. If God didn't love us, he could have destroyed the entire world instead of saving Noah and his family in the ark. He could have just said, well, that's it. Mankind, they're disgusting. They're disappointing. I'm just going to kill the whole lot of them. We'll start off with a new creation. He could have done that. But he loved us. He punished the world, but he didn't save humanity. We need to remember that he does love us. The fact that we're still here on earth and still living is a testimony to the fact that God loves us. He could give the word to Jesus. That's all Jesus is waiting for is for God to give him the nod to come back and begin the judgment. But 2 Peter, in the third chapter, we can see that God's not slack in his, his promises, but that he's always hopeful that perhaps, and I'm loosely paraphrasing here, but he's always hopeful that somebody else may come back. Another soul will be saved. Another lost sheep may come back. But eventually, God's patience will run out. His patience isn't limitless. Is it? talks about how that these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power. Hebrews 10, 26 and 27, For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a certain terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversary. Now some people struggle with this verse. But what more can God do for you if, let's say, you do obey the gospel, you get forgiveness of sins, you get redemption, you have hope of heaven, but then somewhere in life you reject it and you go back into the world. What more can God do for you? It's, you can come back, you can ask him for forgiveness, but as we sometimes say, the ball's in your court. He's not going to force you to come back. He's not going to drag you back kicking and screaming. It's up to you. There's no more sacrifice. Jesus can't come back to this earth and die on the cross again to give you another chance. Well, Colossians 1, 3 through 5, We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always to you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. Hope laid up in heaven. The Bible talks a lot about hope. Hope really helps us. You know, during the past two years, there's been a lot of people who had COVID, and some were very, very sick and ill. Even some people who didn't have to go to the hospital. They stayed home in, in, in the very early stages, sometimes a week or two, they'd be sick. Up all night with with the night sweats and, and with fever and, and chilling and shaking and then they get a little better and then they get sick again, back and forth. What kept those people going? Well, one day I'll get better. Not everybody did, but most did. So that, that's, that's our hope. That's what helps us get through difficult times 
is some hope of improvement, hope of, of, of being healed. And that's what helps us get through the world is hope of heaven. That even that sometimes this world can, can be ugly and it can be discouraging and disappointing and depressing, but yet we still have hope of God. We still have hope in heaven. And so as we get back to our original question, shall we gather at the river for you? And I hope if you're here this morning and you're, you're, you've never been baptized, if you're not a Christian, you, I urge you at least to think about it. Pray about it. And if you are convinced, you can come forward this morning and we, we can help you with that or any time, day or night, in the future. We need to remember that our soul is at stake. Perhaps we, as we've been talking about, we may have someone here this morning who does need to become a Christian. As we've outlined in our lesson, you, you need to acknowledge your faith in God and Christ. You need to be willing to repent, change the direction of your life. You need to be willing to confess Jesus as the Son of God and not stop there, but be baptized into Christ. And then we could probably add another step, and that is be faithful until death, as pointed out in Revelation 2 and verse 10 just doesn't stop at baptism. Sometimes people do that. Oh yeah, I got baptized 30 years ago and really haven't done much since then. That's not going to work either. We've got to be faithful and loyal to God for the rest of our lives. If you're subject in any way, please come forward.